Amen. Great song uh, to prepare us for what we're going to be talking about this morning. I hope you have a Bible. If you do, take it and open it up to Psalm 63. We'll go there in just a few minutes. Psalm 63. I love the story of the little boy who was reading his Bible, and as he was doing so, an uh, old grumpy skeptic walked by, and he couldn't help but observe as this little boy was reading his Bible that every few moments the, the little boy would say, Praise the Lord. And the, the man just watched him for a few moments. And again, every, every few minutes, this little boy was reading this Bible story. And, and, and he would stop and he'd look up and he'd say, praise the Lord. And finally, the old skeptic said, young man, what story are you reading? And the little boy said, I'm reading about when God's people crossed the Red Sea on dry land. And they were rescued from the Egyptians. And the old man said, do you really believe that? I mean, do you really believe how it's written there? He said, don't you know that, that researchers have suggested that, th that this was probably you know, knee-deep water where the people actually walked across the Red Sea? And so it's not really as big a deal as you probably think, young man. Little boy looked back down in his Bible, and he started reading again. And, and for a few minutes, he, just, he was paying attention to the story, and the old man watched him, and, and then in just a moment as the boy was reading, he looked up again, he said, praise the Lord. The old skeptical man said, now what? The little boy said, the Lord drowned the whole Egyptian army in two feet of water. <laughs> now at the end of that story, you remember what happens. We've talked about it a few times in our series, and if if you want to hold your finger there at Psalm 63 and you want to go to uh, Exodus 15, remember after that story actually happened, and, and I believe the biblical account there about the great walls of water, not two feet of water, just to set, set the record straight, obviously. But as soon as this story happens, <clears throat> the people are walking uh, across on dry land and they are rescued and, and they break out uh, in their deliverance in this song of worship and praise. We talked about this last week, Exodus chapter 15, probably a precursor to what would later become the book of Psalms. This is a psalm of praise to God. But you know, we often forget what happens in the next few verses. In the next few verses, that psalm of praise becomes something else. And at the end of chapter 15, if you look over to the end of chapter 15, it notes that they were at a place called Elam. And there, there were 12 wells of water, lots of water to drink. And it says there were 70 palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. But then watch the transition as we go into chapter 16. And as they journeyed from Elam, the place where all the water was, all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness. The first time we read about this term in this particular story, they came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the Lord, of the children of Israel, complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into this wilderness." to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Three times in these three verses in Exodus 16, verses 1 through 3, we read about the term, the wilderness. And, and I want you to, to, to draw a comparison to what had been happening. Praise in a place where there was abundant water, and there was comfort, there was shade, and all of a sudden now they're in the wilderness and there is no water. The food's going to be scarce. The blazing sun is going to be beating down. You can just see the contrast between the praise and now the wilderness. And so today, our lesson is about worship in the wilderness. There, there is this contrast, obviously, between 
what we noted last week, the, the book of Psalms being a book of praise psalms, and really the two parts of Psalms that I mentioned last week, if you remember, it can be broken down into two parts, basically the Psalms of praise and the Psalms of lament. And now we are starting to see the lament side of the, the Psalms. And particularly tonight, or rather this morning, we're going to give a lot of attention to Psalm 63. We're going to go over there in just a moment to Psalm 63 as we talk about worship in the wilderness. I want you to think about it in these terms. Ever since Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden, mankind has lived in the wilderness. Mankind has not known the garden of God, the paradise of God, the true blessing of His presence, unencumbered by all of our problems and especially our sin. We, we just have not known that. And Michael Card writes, you and I were created to wake up in the garden, the Garden of Eden. We were created to wake up in the garden. But when we open our eyes, we find ourselves in the wilderness. And so that necessitates the very concept of wilderness worship. If we're going to be in a relationship with our God and, and we've come to Him for redemption, we're going to have to find ourselves, even as redeemed people, still wandering through the wilderness of this world. And this world is hard. This world is difficult. And the, the praise we give to God, the service we give to God, the worship we give to God is going to be offered up to Him in the wilderness and so because the wilderness exists there will be lament this is the other side of the psalms every great bible character had to learn lament job had to learn lament jeremiah was called the weeping prophet lament even our lord jesus was one who understood lament if he might have been looking over Jerusalem and weeping for Jerusalem, or in the garden weeping, lamenting, crying out because of what he was about to do, as Hebrews 5 and verse 7 records. But I would tell you, the greatest lamenter of them all was David. David was the greatest lamenter. He found himself in the wilderness quite often in his life. To me, a man who was so blessed, he found himself in the wilderness quite often. Maybe it was because of his enemies. Perhaps it was because of loneliness or because of betrayal or even because of the pain of his sin. He found himself from time to time in the wilderness. But here is what we learn from David, and it's the emphasis of our lesson this morning and that is when you're in the wilderness you still need to worship when you're in the wilderness of your life when you are encountering those days when you don't know all the answers when you're in encountering those who are against you some somebody's trying to hurt you they're trying to pain you when 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 you're work is uncertain when the way you're going to provide for your family is uncertain when you're starting to have health issues when someone in your family is having health issues when you failed morally and sin has entered into your life and it's brought these awful terrible consequences no matter where you are in your life you can relate to being in the wilderness. And during those times, what we learned from David is that we need God during those times. We need to worship God during those times. When we come together and worship, it can be a time of rejoicing and praise and happiness. And I'm glad to see you and you're glad to see me. It can be a time like that. And often it is a time like that. But there will always be someone that's here and you ask them how you're doing and they'll say i'm doing just fine but that's just those are just words because they're not doing just fine and they're in the wilderness and they're hurting and they're suffering and it praise be to god they've chosen to worship god in the wilderness it's something we've got to do it's something that 
we will continue to have to do until the Lord comes back and He restores what He always intended for us to have, that unique, close relationship with Him. We're talking about David worshiping in the wilderness. When you think about David's life, there were three times during his life, distinct times, where he was in the wilderness. One of those times was when he was a young shepherd boy. And this is when we would read stories about him killing a lion or a bear. 1 Samuel chapter 17. He, during those times, no doubt, learned how to use his slingshot that would later come in handy when he would face Goliath. He learned about being a shepherd during those days, and that would come in handy when he would need to shepherd the people of God as a king. And then the second time we read about him being in the wilderness was when he was running for his life from Saul. Running for his life from Saul. You remember that, 1 Samuel chapter 19 uh, through chapter 27. A big portion of, of the Scripture there accounts for this. But then the third time he's in the wilderness is when he is fleeing from his son Absalom. You read about this in 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 19. And it's when David was in the wilderness fleeing from Absalom, the scholars believe that he wrote this 63rd Psalm. It was a very inhospitable environment. Disastrous consequences, mostly beyond his control at this moment in his life, in Psalm 63. It was his son, Absalom. Who, who instigated a revolt against him. And so David has to flee from Jerusalem and from the sanctuary. And he has to go into the Judean desert. And scholars believe that this was likely at the end of the summer when these events are occurring. And according to the geologists, this area can support a grass and flowers, but that's only during the rainy season. Like most areas, there's a rainy season, there's a dry season. And the end of the summer would have been a dry season. And so the land would have been hot, it would have been parched. And this is the very wilderness that Isaiah described when he said in Isaiah 40 and verse 7, the grass withers and the flower fades. The physical environment and circumstances would not have been good for David during this period of his life in the wilderness. And so Psalm 63 is an account of what's going on during that time in his life. And as I've said, it not only emphasizes the, the reality of wilderness worship, but what we see in Psalm 63 is the reason why this is the case. We should understand that we worship God at any point and at all points in our life. But I think sometimes we need the reminder of why we do this when the times aren't good. And that's really what Psalm 63 is about. And in the next few minutes, I want to show you as we work our way through this psalm, this beautiful psalm, I want to show you three reasons why David understood the value of worshiping God in the wilderness. Here's the first reason he understood that. According to verses 1 through 4, he understood that worship is a natural need for God's people. Worship is natural. It is just as natural as your desire when you get thirsty for a drink of water. Let's read what he says here. Psalm starts like this. Oh God, you are my God. We sang that song. It's beautiful. He says, early I will seek you. Notice he says, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Obviously, the lifting up of hands references his desire to worship God. David is in this dry, parched wilderness 
And he reminds us that even when bad things are happening, we still need to take the time to worship God. Worship should not be abandoned. Even though he's separated from Jerusalem, he's separated from the sanctuary, he still is thirsting after God. As a matter of fact, it's increasing his thirst for God because he's separated from there. And, and during this very literal time, according to 1 Samuel chapter 17, 29, David and the people with him uh, who were fleeing from Absalom, it says they were hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. So the physical situation is mimicking the, the, the need of his soul at this time. He's thirsty. Not just literally, but he's thirsty spiritually and so this is something that david realized shouldn't keep him from god and it shouldn't keep him from worshiping god and and why would he feel this way even though times are not good you know our minds do strange things when times aren't good when things aren't good in our life and, and this is by the way this is one of those times when the devil really is working on us he is trying to work his way into our life when these bad things come along Sometimes it's because of him these bad things come along. But why did David remember this need for worship? Well, it's because he knew his God. And what you see here in these first uh, four verses or so, uh, you see his need to worship was based upon his knowledge of God. No, notice what he sees in his God. He sees that his God is a personal God. He says, God, you are my God. God, you're my God. David's God was not a, gold of, a, a God of silver or, or gold or stone or wood. He was a real, personal God. David's God was a powerful God. He says in verse 2, as you can see, I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. And he knew that his God also was a providing God. According to verse 3, he remembered his loving kindness. Was is associated with the word faithfulness. Loving kindness and faithfulness often go hand in hand. And he knew that his God was a providing God. This is why even though he was in the desert, he was in the wilderness, he still desired his God. He knew it was a natural thing. Just as he was thirsty... As we're about to see, just as he was hungry, he knew he still needed God. It's a natural thing. The second reason we worship while we're in the wilderness is because worship fills us with something that nothing else can. Worship gives us, it fills us up with something that nothing else in this world can. Let's read verses 5 through 7. He says, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. We'll come back and explain that in just a moment. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. There's the, 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 the idea of worship and singing songs of praise to God. He says, I'll do this when I remember you on my bed and I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. In these verses separated from the comforts of his city and the sanctuary, David recalls a meal. He recalls a feast. He says there in verse 5, that my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. The footnote in my Bible says this is literally fat and abundance. And as the NIV translates it, the richest of food. Think about who we're talking about. We're talking about David. We're talking about a king. We're talking about someone who knew good, rich food. And, and remember, he's thirsty. He's hungry. He's on the run. And that craving and gnawing in his stomach doesn't just remind him of good food. It reminds him of the worship that he needs he knows that it's the real need he had at that time in his life and it was that worship that could give him something that nothing else could in these times of being separated 
wandering in the wilderness. Only David's soul could be satisfied with worship. That's what he's reminding us. And as a matter of fact, some think the thoughts of the, the marrow and fatness or the riches of foods possibly didn't necessarily have to do with the food that would be set at the king's table. Some scholars believe that this is a reference to uh, the sweet-smelling aroma of the burning fat on the altar of God. And some say that when that offering was being given and that meat was actually burning, some people have described it as the smell that we associate with with barbecue smoked food i got some of your attention right then i saw that <laughs> barbecue just think about that I, I i like to smoke meat i'm not real good at it i've got a cheap little smoker some of you guys that have the expensive stuff i, I i'd like to know more about how you do that but you know you get some meat and you put some wood to it and you let it smoke and the smell of that will make your mouth water you know what i'm talking about if you like smoked barbecue meat and that might have been the smell that david is thinking about remembering longing for and not just the food that would fill his belly but the worship that would fill his soul the worship associated with what God was asking for them, from them during those days. And David is now separated from being able to participate in that the way he could in Jerusalem, but yet he still is hungering and he's thirsting for that. What, what he is teaching us is that worship gives us something that nothing else can. It has been said that when we were created, we were created with a God-sized hole in our heart. And only God can fill that hole. Now, now that's not some kind of lesson about your physical body. It's, just a, it's about your spiritual body. There is something in every human being that longs to worship. And the hole in our heart, if, if it could be put that way, it needs to be filled with God. And only God can fill that but a lot of people try to fill it with other things so a lot of people don't worship god but they worship other things and they fill up the emptiness that they feel the desire they have to give something loyalty and literally worship they fill it up with other things and there's a danger there that we don't fill that that hole that need in our heart in our soul with god but, th but that's what David is saying here. David is saying you, you fill up your need with God. And he is reminding us only God can fill that need. You've got to discover that. You've got to honor that with your life. And God's the only one that can do that. And David understood that. He, notice he says here in these verses, he says, you know, God, you're the one that feeds me. Verse 5. If you see in verse 7, he says, you're the one who helps me. Notice what he says in verse 6, though. I'll put those out a little bit out of the order. But he says, he says, I will remember you on my bed. I will meditate on you in the night watches. David was a shepherd. He was around sheep. And it's said that sheep have four stomachs and so david learned something from watching sheep a shepherd what does a shepherd do he leads the sheep by the still waters and the green pastures and david had done that he had seen these sheep graze but you know what a sheep will do after they eat for the first time they swallow that food and it goes down into what they call the first stomach and then they go and lie down and they sounds a little nasty but they regurgitate that and they chew on it again. And then they swallow it and it goes down into the second stomach. And my understanding is the Hebrew word for regurgitation that takes place when a sheep regurgitates and chews it over again is the word meditate. 
David says, you give me what I need as I meditate on you and your will. I, you comfort me as I think about these things, as I regurgitate them in my mind. That's something that we need to do more of. Not just read the Word, but meditate on the Word. And only God can fill that void in you. And David reminds us of that. Even when you're in the wilderness, whatever you think you need, don't forget you need God. And then here's the third and the final thing. The reason why we should worship um, God in the wilderness, and that is, worship allows me to lay down my burdens at God's feet. Worship allows me to lay down my burdens at God's feet. Let's read again verses 8, 9, and 10. He says, My soul follows close behind you, and your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for the jackals. Scholars see these verses as David calling out for God's retribution on his enemies. And the technical name for this is imprecatory psalm. This is an imprecatory psalm. And sometimes you'll read in the psalms well, the, 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 the person offering these thoughts, the, the thoughts from man to God. As we said last week, the thoughts from man to God are, are inspired in this book. And here's the, the thoughts of a, a man or the psalmist, whoever the, the psalmist might be. And, and, and it's their thoughts to God, but these are inspired. And, and when their thoughts to God has to do with God answering their pleas and, and, and creating justice, for those who are, you know, out to get them. When, when the one who is disturbed by this is calling out to God, they call that the imprecatory psalm. And just think about it for a moment. As we said just a moment ago, David knew the Torah. He knew the law. He would meditate on the law. And it was probably during times like this that he could remember the principle from Deuteronomy 32, 35 that's, it says, vengeance is mine. And when Paul would later repeat that, he would say, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Uh, over in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. That's the implication. David was thinking about how God is a God who is just. And God is the kind of God who repays. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And while these imprecatory psalms are a, a feature of the emotional nature of psalms, I think what David is really showing us here is that worship is also a way to unload that burden. It is a way to bring what bothers you, what's on your heart, what's on your soul, what is weighing you down, and, and to come in worship and lay that down before God. He's probably having a flashback to his days as a shepherd. Now he's a king. But he's probably thinking about when he was a shepherd because in verse 8 he says, My soul follows close behind you. When David was a shepherd, he knew what those sheep would do. They would... They would gather around him. They would follow close to him. Why? Because they can't defend themselves. The shepherd is a one who has a, a mighty right hand to protect. And he says, My, your right hand upholds me. Anytime the scripture talks about the right hand, it's, it's about power and authority. But in this case, power. David is saying, I, I follow close to you, God, because you're the only one that can really protect me. You've got a, a strong, mighty right hand. And, and by the way, that's a hand of justice. That's why he calls out for justice on those who are trying to do the wrong thing. See, David, during this time, when the revolt was happening, led by his son Absalom, he had to trust in God. During this very time when 20,000 Israelites in the woods of Ephraim would meet their doom along with Absalom, 
David was praying and he was worshiping and he was saying, God, you're the only one who can make this right. And, and I'm bringing this and I'm laying it down at your feet. This is a reminder by David that when your heart is broken, when you're in the wilderness, don't forget to worship. And so as I said before, because of the fall of man from that beautiful, blessed relationship that we had at, at one moment and that we can understand in some kind of far-fetched way through Adam and Eve and the, the presence they had with God, once they were expelled, we were expelled. And now we just are wandering in the, the wilderness the rest of our days until the Lord comes and changes all of this, we're going to be wandering through the wilderness. And there are going to be those days when you're there and I'm there. And David says, this is what you do and this is why you do it. The literary construction of Psalms is built around three statements. Of, of Psalm 63. It's built around three statements. You, you may have noticed. He says, my soul, three different times. In all three of these sections. Notice he says in verse number one, my soul thirsts for you. My soul thirsts for you. And this is a reminder that I need worship. It's just as natural as when I'm thirsty wanting a glass of water. My soul thirsts for you. He says in verse five, my soul shall be satisfied. It's a reminder that worship fills me and gives me that which nothing else can. And then in verse 8, he says, and my soul follows you. It's a reminder that even during those difficult times, we don't forget God. And we follow Him. And we lay our troubles at His feet in our lament of worship. And so I want to ask you today as we conclude this lesson, how is your soul? Do you find yourself in some ways in Psalm 63? Your soul hurting, your soul breaking. Perhaps it's because of something beyond your control. Like in this case with David, it was something beyond his control. Couldn't do anything about it. He just had to give it all to God. Or maybe it's something that's because of what you've done. Th those are the ones that maybe bother us just as much sometimes people are bothered by I, I didn't do anything to deserve this it's life and then some people are more bothered by the fact i did this and if i could just go back and change it but we know we can't and and we're in the wilderness because of our sin david could relate to that too david could relate to that too that that psalm in psalm 32 tells us the pain that he felt from his sin. And Psalm 51 shows us the only way back is to give God the only thing he really wants during those times, and that is the acknowledgement that you've sinned, and only the only thing you've got to offer him is your broken and contrite heart. And, and if that is the wilderness you're in, that's all God wants from you. He wants your acknowledgement of your sin. He wants your broken and contrite heart. He just wants you to come back to Him. And so we want to give you the opportunity today, if you need to respond to your God, a God who loves you, provides for you, has paved the way for you to come back to Him through His Son, Jesus. If, if you have that need today, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. You can walk to the front. We'll assist you. A couple of our elders who can shepherd your soul will be back near the library. Uh, whichever way you'd like to respond, we'd encourage you to take advantage of your desire to come back to God if that's what your need is. Right now as we stand and as we sing.